James, what's going on, man? Thanks for joining me on the Order of Man podcast. Absolutely. I've been looking forward to it. I know, gosh, I've had to reschedule a couple of times. Um, we had that that event up here a couple of, well, it must have been three weeks ago now. I think I told you about that on the day that we were supposed to have a conversation. Yeah. Did you hear about that at all? Uh, no, but uh, for everybody listening, I get this text. It's like, hey, man, I know we're supposed to do a podcast, but I got to do some hero shit. So can you reschedule? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate your understanding. Uh, if anybody would understand that, it would certainly be you. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty wild. We had this um, <clears throat> this building in a, in a neighboring town pretty close to us, and uh, it had been pumping full of propane because there was a leak or a, a malfunction with the tank. It had been pumping full of propane, upwards of 400 gallons of propane over the weekend. And uh, hopefully, uh, luckily and fortunately, they evacuated everybody in the building. Uh, there was a, it's a school bus stop right by there. They, they got the kids out of there beforehand. They had got on the school bus, but yeah, there were some firefighters in there when the building exploded. Um, pretty, pretty devastating to them and their crew and the community. It's been rough. Wild stuff. I guess, uh, I guess what we're talking about, whether it's a, a, a violent encounter, a potential violent, violent encounter, or just being ready for these types of emergencies is critical. Yeah, when it's least expected, you're elected. Yeah, I think I that's that's a great way to say it. I was looking at uh, some some things maybe on uh, on Instagram today, looking at you and seeing what you were up to, and I think you had um, made a post about no days off. There's no days off. There's no time off. Like you've got to be on a hundred percent of the time. Yeah, I I mean like I get up and get dressed, and all these guys are like, well, I don't want to carry a gun. That's fine, but I carry. Two guns, two lights. I carry a medical kit two, with two tourniquets, pressure bandages, chest seals. Like when I, it's part of what I wear every day. And and this is when I'm not expecting any trouble at all. And uh, and there's just so many. And I know how to use all this stuff. And uh, and uh, so many people want to make excuses, but nobody. I've never heard anybody uh, retelling a story and saying, "Man, I'm glad I didn't have that tourniquet." Man, I'm glad I didn't have that gun. I've I've just never heard anybody say anything like that before. Yeah, uh, what is their reasoning when they say I just don't want to carry a gun? I mean, it's it's I guess maybe not convenient. Is that the biggest issue? They say they're not comfortable, and I go, they're not mm. supposed to be. They're supposed to be comforting, huh. and uh, lack of dedication. Same reason people won't get up and and work out or or, or you know whatever, just like like a motivation, dedication. Yeah. And it seems to me just maybe even just a priority, right? It's not a priority. I think most people would rather remain ignorant, uh, keep the blindfold on, assume that, you know, nothing's going to happen to me. And you know what? Odds are it's not, but you don't want it to be the day where it does happen to you and you're not ready for it. But here's the thing, like, um, you know, <clears throat> you know, about being a man, being a warrior, what the fuck else are we going to do? Like, Walking the path is the only way I know to walk through life. Like, I don't know how to walk through lackadaisical. I don't know how to walk through without purpose. I don't know how to walk through without meaning. And I see all these guys that are unhappy with their wife and their kids and their family. They just want to get out. They just want to, you know, they can't, they can't stand it. And I'm, I like everything about my life. I love my family. I, I love my grandkids and, and my wife and, and, I, I love my job. I love everything. And I believe that's because I walk that path uh, and not because uh, not because I tr I've tried to avoid it. Yeah, you bring up a good point. And, and I, I think, I mean, to go back to what we were saying as far as it might not happen to you, walking this path that you're talking about isn't going to put you in a worse position. Right. So, so let's say you do this training and, you, and you've got medical training, firearms training, you're prepared, you, you've developed some level of situational awareness and you never have to use it. It's not like that was a waste because it improved every other area of your life. Well, but the, the, the pursuit of this, the pursuit of mastery, I have memories. I have fond memories of chasing this thing my whole life. If I did something else like bowling or watching TV or, or fishing, I doubt I would be as fulfilled. I'm 49. And for a lot of, for a lot of guys, this is the point in their life when they're going through their, you know, their, their crisis, you know, uh, their midlife crisis. So they're, they're buying the, the convertibles and, and cheating on their wife and, and all of that. And I feel completely fulfilled with my mm. life, my business, my 
my life. I feel completely fulfilled. I have no need to, to wander anywhere else. And all the memories, the bonds, the, the relationships that I have with all these people that I've been in, in combat with or just in a training class with, um, I, I can't imagine another thing I would have done to have this much closeness with this many people. When you say chasing the thing, you know, quote unquote thing, what would you define that as? What, what is it that you're trying to master? Um, <laughs> um, the, the, I believe the, you know, the, the mastery of the sword, you know, the, the pistol, the, the, the self-defense, the mastery of it is, it is, it's very Bushido. It's very much all encompassing. Because you shouldn't be carrying a pistol if you're not a good person, if you don't have a good soul, if you're if you're a drug abuser or alcohol abuser or whatever, you should not be carrying a pistol. You, you know, and so I don't drink, I don't smoke, I never have, I don't do drugs, I never have. And it's it's the pursuit of this uh, this this mastery that is that is um, it's a lot of people think they have something missing from their life. And it's because they are not pursuing anything. Mm. They have no goal. They're just trying to get to next Friday for the weekend. I don't have weekends. Like I don't work. Um, I, I don't know if I can if I can nail this down to a uh, according to Hoyle kind of definition for you. But uh, uh, the martial lifestyle is the path. And and when I first started walking it, I thought. There would be an end or I could get to a point where I could see further or whatever. And I, I realize now it's just you got to keep slugging along and and the pursuit of that perfection. Uh, and I'm not going to say my life is perfect, but that pursuit of that perfection is what keeps me fulfilled and keeps me on track, keeps me again. Uh, it keeps me honest. It keeps me faithful to my wife and to my family and, and all those things. Because if, if I'm not, if I'm a liar, if I'm a cheat, if I'm a scoundrel, then I'm obviously I'm not walking the path and cannot come and that cannot continue. Yeah. You know, I imagine that the skills that you develop are very translatable to other areas of your life. And, and that's what I would Everything. say to other guys as well is, you know, training with a pistol, uh, training with martial arts, being prepared, like, this stuff is translatable. It's not only applicable to some sort of emergency or critical situation you may find yourself in. Yeah. I mean, like, for instance, like if you're walking the path, you're not a road rager. You're never mm. going to blow your horn to show an emotion. The only, the only way a martial artist would blow his horn is to prevent an accident, never to show emotion. Mm. Uh, and so that's, that's one example of it. Like, like there's been many times I've thought to myself, if I wasn't wearing the, this pistol, I'd bitch slap that motherfucker right now. Mm. <laughs> and and it's not the way. It's not the path. I like that. That's that's the uh, the adage with with great power comes great responsibility, right? And it seems like your ability to do, frankly, to do harm to another individual, uh, it seems like you take that very seriously and you carry a lot of responsibility with that with that power that you have. Absolutely. That's a that's a quote from Spider Man. I've been a that's right. Fan. That's right. <laughs> I've been a Spider-Man fan since I was a, a boy. M my mom actually blames the old Spider-Man comics on my sarcasm because he was so sarcastic back in the old <laughs> comic books and stuff. She actually blames Spider-Man for that. But, um, uh, well, let's talk about Spider-Man for a second. It's a perfect example of the duality of man, the yin and yang inside of a man. Spider-Man never had a bad day. It never rained on Spider-Man. Spider-Man was on top of his game. Everything was perfect for Spider-Man. The exact opposite was true of Peter Parker. It was always raining on Peter Parker. Women never liked Peter Parker. He's always broke. He was always, you know, it was always, he's, Peter Parker walked with, with his head down. Spider-Man walked with his chest out. And uh, there was, there's, that's a very, that, that comic for me as a kid started showing me the yin and yang of, of who each human being is. And, um, and along those lines, and 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 I, I'm not saying this to to nitpick with anybody or whatever, but uh, violence is a tool of evil, and force is a tool of good. And so, mm. like when when a, when a bank robber is shooting at the police, they are being violent. When a cop shoots back at him, he is using force. And I believe that is the yin and yang of of you know 
the wicked things that men do to each other. I, I, I don't believe that that I am violent. I, I, I believe that I use force when necessary. And violence is, a, uh, is again, a, a tool of evil. That's interesting. I've never ho- looked at it like that. On the surface level, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that, but I, I do see the distinction of it. I understand that, that the way I say it is is unique and different than, than the way most people look at it. I don't and I understand when somebody says, you know, this, you know, you know using violence, you know, in a in a in a martial way. I know that it's a, a good thing. I know that that's how they mean it. But um, if we if you look up the definitions of those words, uh, basically, the basically there is a difference between those two things. And violence typically is what the bad guys use. <laughs> Yeah, I think regardless of what words you decide to use, I think the point that you're making is a good distinction. Force to me, based on what you're saying, is having the capacity to do harm or violence to another individual, but having the morality to exercise it in the right context. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, it's the exact same thing. It's the morality that separates the two. Where do you believe that uh, that morality comes from? Is that a, is that a higher power? Is that up to each of us to decide? Is there some sort of standard by which it's measured? W- what's your thoughts on that? Well, it's it's definitely nurture over nature. I, I don't believe we're born with it. I believe that the social norms that are derived with within our communities. I mean, if we even within the subsets of our community, a a uh, 19-year-old Marine just out of boot camp is different than a 19-year-old kid that works at Starbucks. Mm-hmm. And uh, and th- th- their, their worldview is different. Uh, even though we're from the same society, um, I believe that uh, that the, the young Marine has a completely different uh, understanding of the use of force or violence or however you want to say it. Because yeah, you think that's been conditioned into them is what you're saying? Well, like, for instance, when I was a boy, I have a brother – uh, and we, we want to play with little cap guns when we were kids. And my grandmother cautioned my mother. She said, don't let those boys play with those guns. They'll grow up to be bank robbers. And then as I got older, I thought, why couldn't I be a cop? We, eventually mm-hmm. I became a cop. Well, why, did it, why did it have to be bad? So the reason I make the distinction between violence and, and force is because not every use uh, of force is violent. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a matter of rage or uh, or to to take something from somebody. Eh, eh, we we could talk about that for. Yeah, hours. I mean, depending on the situation, right? There might be a situation where where you you potentially need to restrain somebody, but that wouldn't necessarily be violent. But there might also be a situation where you need to uh, fire a bullet into somebody's chest, and you know, so depending on the severity and the situation you're dealt with, there's varying degrees of that. Right. Where did this all start for you? You know, you you were talking about Spider-Man and 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 beginning to walk this path. Like, what did it look like for you when you got got going? Well, uh, as I, mom and dad got a divorce when I was five, so I was raised with a by a single mom, and she worked all the time. And I look back now, and like she took us to to little league and to karate and to boxing and all these things when we were kids. But uh, I grew up really poor. And I, I fought a lot in school and I, and I, and I didn't want to, I, I, I didn't, I don't want to fight, fight now. Uh, but, um, I didn't want to, but I realized that from a very young age, if I wanted to keep the swing at some point, I was going to have to fight for it or my, or whatever the thing was mm-hmm. kids always. And I, and I grew up in a, you know, I grew up, I went to school, um, born in 70. So I started school in 75. And so during the seventies and eighties, I mean, like the, 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 you know, the typical thing was the football coach was also the math or history teacher. Sure, right. <laughs> and, yep. And if you had some, if you had some disagreement with somebody in the class, he would just tell you, wait till you go outside. Or he would just say, go outside, come back in when this is over with. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we, we live in a, we live in a different world now, but, but I grew up and I, and I realized very early what was worth fighting for and what was not worth fighting for. And it always kept coming down to about my dignity. I didn't want the the older kids like, you know, pushing me down, sitting on my head. I'd seen them do that to other kids. And so it was always about my dignity and and who I was as a person and self-esteem and growing up really poor. uh, Self-esteem is is a commodity. It's it's hard to uh, it's it's hard to get and it's hard to keep. And uh, so I wanted to make sure I kept all that I had. How do you what do you make the distinction for now when you think about what's worth fighting for? Because, I mean, yeah, I hear dignity and, and that might be a pride thing. I think 
I think to a degree we probably mature out of that to some degree, right? Or, or ho- maybe hopefully we should. <laughs> So how do you determine what's worth fighting for and and engaging with now? Well, I mean, I have to assume that uh, any fight I get in now is going to be a fight for my life because I don't, again, I don't, I don't go stupid places with stupid people and do stupid shit. So uh, it's obviously going to, that's going to be it. So I, in a world of, in a world of weapon system platform, people using multi-syllable words for things that don't need it. I will say this, (laughs) Here is my here's here is my legal lecture. Before you put your finger on the trigger, ask yourself whose life are you about to save? Mm. And uh, that's that's your legal lecture. That's all you need to know to carry a fucking gun around. If you follow that, and you can save your life, you can save a total stranger's life. Uh, but we don't use guns to kill people. We use guns to save people, and that's and that's how I that's how I live my life. Yeah, that's a that's a valuable distinction. And you also talk about too, I mean, at length, this is what you do, the role of of training with that firearm. I think there's too many guys who believe because they have a gun on their hip that they're that they're safe or you know, they're exercising their rights. Maybe they maybe they shouldn't necessarily be just because they're carrying a piece of metal around on their hip. But uh I mean that training is critically important as well. Well, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a can of worms right there. Um, I'm not saying that a person has to have training uh, to, to be able to defend themselves. People defend themselves all the time without it. Uh, but what what I'll tell you is this, the more training you have, the less likely you are to even get into a situation where you need a gun. And uh, and what's, what's that worth? And I, I tell people all the time, if you get picked to be assaulted, fight for your life, you know, defend yourself, but then back it up. Why did they pick you? Mm. Like, were you not paying attention, looking down at your phone? You know, you know, like you got picked for a reason. And, uh, so stop getting picked. Um, but, um, but a lot of people carry a gun, uh, as a, as a magical charm, as a talisman to ward off evil spirits. And, and, uh, unfortunately because of movies, you know, they, they think that they don't have to practice. They just shoot and people fly through the air and all that. But uh, <laughs> for the people that do go out and train with me or somebody else, they realize very quickly what they were missing. Uh, and for a lot of people, it, it lights a fire. It, 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 uh, it begins a thirst that uh, is unquenchable for, for more information. Uh, and, uh, and I tell people all the time, they go, wow, you know, you're, you're really lucky. And I go, the more I train, the luckier I am. I believe that training basically makes you see more advantageous opportunities than the untrained person. Yeah. I also think based on what I've experienced personally and what I've heard with other men is that you understand the dire ramifications of using the tools and the training at your disposal. Oh, like you yeah, understand I- that somebody's going to die and, and that's significant to you. Somebody who doesn't have this training does not understand the consequences. Right. When I was policing, my, my, my chiefs and sheriffs over the years said, oh, Yeager, you're doing all this training. You must want to shoot somebody. And I'd say, I am least likely to shoot somebody than anybody in the department because I don't walk into dangerous situations headlong. I use cover when I do this or that. I'm, 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 most, most cops get into gunfights because they have poor tactics leading up to the gunfight. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, yeah, it's always that they think you're the gun nut, but actually the, the furthest thing could be from, you know, furthest thing is the truth. Yeah. I imagine you have a bit of a persona, like, like a hard a, you know, I, I I've followed you for quite a while now and I see you engage with your family and I, I, I don't see that. I mean, I, I could see how somebody might think that from the outside looking in without maybe knowing you, but then you see like you're a human being, you, you have empathy and obviously love for your family and, and. I think that's important that we make that make that uh, very clear because it seems to me there's a com- common misconception that uh, somebody who's trained in violence or force, whatever term you want to use, uh, is is just the hard A, and they aren't considering some of these other factors that most of us probably would take into consideration. Well, it's it's again the the duality of it is um, I'm trying to get as many hours of practice. It's 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 a long haul. Uh, doing medical, uh, drills as I am doing firearms drills. I'm way behind, but I, but I, but I practice a lot, I practice sitting at my desk, putting tourniquets on things like that. And, and, uh, and then, uh, and I, I make sure I, I make time 
I, I want to, but I make time for my family. We can't be all, none of us can only be one thing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's impossible. And, and, mm-hmm. and, and uh, like, uh, sometimes guys are like, man, you know, uh, you know, I wish I was single again. I hear him say something like that. And I go, no, you don't. You, that's horrible. <laughs> you know, I don't know any single people that are happy. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's quite it's quite the runaround from my perspective. I, I remember like the dating scene and everything else. I, I hated it. I hated it. I'm so much more fulfilled and happy in, in, in my family and with kids and, and having that uh, that grounding element of my life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's. <laughs> Yeah, I'd go crazy without my family. Yeah, just sure. you know, and don't get me wrong. I'm yeah, you know, I'm on the range. A bunch of dudes like, hey, let's shoot guns, and you know, like yeah, yeah, that's part of my life. But yeah, I like you know, n- n- nothing. And guys that guys that have never done this before, they don't know they're missing. A newborn baby sleeping on your chest is the is the best thing in the world. It's the exact opposite of all the man shit that we do, and it's absolutely the most fantastic feeling in the world. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. I got a little while for me before that happens again, but uh, <laughs> they're a little outgrowing of the, the laying on me. If any of my kids laid on me, that might crush me at this point. They're getting big. <laughs> well, well, I'll have my sixth grandkid and uh, my uh, my uh, uh, third grandson, fourth grandson here in uh, January. So I plan awesome. on getting some of that little guy. So. Yeah, congrats. That's exciting. Yeah. I want to go back to uh, what you're talking about with, with not being, I think, did you use the term selected or picked? Uh, what are some things that somebody who's in a public, in an outside setting, public setting, uh, do to avoid being selected or picked by a, a would-be criminal? Or It's easy. Uh, yeah, it's, it's totally easy. We are hunters. We have binocular vision, our eyes on the front of our head. Food has eyes on the side of its head. Predators, hmm. which we are, walk with their head up. Uh, I tell people all the time when they when they have their I don't have my phone here I don't bring it into the interview but we'll say this thing is a phone I tell mm-hmm. people all the time there's no rule that says that you have to look down at your phone you can hold your phone up you can hold your phone up I guess but people don't do every time people's got their phone up like this they're taking a selfie right yeah but you yeah can walk around, you can walk around with your phone like that but I tell people all the time uh, unless you're in a unless you're in a, a relatively safe place. Don't look at your phone. And especially if you're walking in public, you shouldn't be looking at your phone, you know, but uh, basically big picture stuff, binocular vision, keep your head up, keep your shoulders back. And that's, and that's, that's the biggest thing. It's kind of like the, uh, the, the joke. Uh, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you, but you don't sure. have to look like the baddest dude that ever walked the earth. You just have to, as they look out, like, no, nah, not that guy. No, not, not him. And, and, and you'll notice if you start walking around or keeping your head up out in public, you're every once in a while, you're going to, you're going to catch a set of eyes looking at you. You're either looking at it. You're either looking at a wolf or another sheepdog. That's it. Mm. That's the the only eyes that you will see as you look around. Yeah. As you look around and you make eye contact with the dude, he's either a really good guy or a really bad guy. Yeah. And even if he's a bad guy, it's good that you acknowledged him because you got your eyes on him and he sees that you got your eyes on him. Uh, Pat McNamara, who I know you're, you're a friend uh, of and, and with, he talks about the same thing, 45 degree culture, he calls it, where your head's just always on that 45 degree line, looking down at your phone, not being aware about what's going on around you. Yeah, it's tough. tough. Pat, Pat's, Pat's a good dude, man. He's a hundred miles an hour. I like that guy. No doubt. I mean, we, we, him and I had a conversation, uh, must've been about a month ago or so. And, uh, man, fa- fascinating, man. Um, and like you said, I think that's a great descriptor, hundred miles an hour, no stop, no quit. Just go, 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 go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, uh, no, he's, awesome. he's one of the few guys, uh, one of the, one of the few guys that I host here at my range. And, um, because I tell my students walking the path, you can't just train with me. You can't just train with any one instructor. And so I bring in guys that I respect like Pat and these other guys and uh, Super Dave Harrington and John Farnham and 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 these guys, I bring them through and I do do something for them and I do something for my students because what I do for them is I don't charge them a range fee to use my range and I and I recruit classfuls of people for them and so I'm doing a favor for them and for my students and uh, and then and then my students are more fulfilled uh, and my friends have another stop on their their list or trying to make their, their house payment. And now they can make their house payment, you know? So, yeah. uh, so uh, it's, 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 that's a lot of fun for me to do. Is the goal of getting them multiple trainers, different looks just to get them different exposure, different lessons, people learn things differently. Is that, is that the whole idea? It's all that. And 
you don't know if what I'm telling you is correct unless you hear somebody else say something different or the same or whatever the case may be. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, uh, it's, uh, I tell all my students, it's, it got, it's got to pass the smell test. If I'm teaching you something, it smells like I'm just making something up or it smells like I'm trying to justify teaching this thing. I said, don't, don't listen to me. You know, it should just make it should just make sense. Like this stuff's not that complicated. People try to overcomplicate this stuff. Like I was just telling you about like my legal lecture and all that stuff. They try to overcomplicate this stuff, but it's not complicated. Uh, it's the, 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 the problem is, is that, um, you have to be closer to the master end of it, uh, than the beginner side of it to make it simple. <laughs> and yeah, so, that's true. I mean, it, even if you just look around on, on social media, look around on Instagram, every, every dude with a gun is an expert, right? And <laughs> And, and I, I've found not only when it comes to firearms training and martial arts and things like that, that the more complicated somebody makes it, yeah. the less likely it is they know what they're talking about and the harder they're trying to sell you their course or their program or whatever it is they're after. Yeah, I call it wordiology. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, my, it's true. I, I'll give you an example. Since we were just talking about Pat Mack, this is this is relevant or semi-relevant. Um, so – when I take these classes, when people come through, I've been doing this a long time and I'm not going to say I don't learn things, but I don't learn as much as I did when I was a beginner. And when I was a beginner, I was learning how to shoot. But now what I'm doing is I am listening to what do they say? What words do they use? How are they explaining these things? I'm looking for like the sprinkles, you know, like the, like the little stuff that just makes it work. And Pat Mack gave this explanation for a uh, natural point of aim. He said, comfortably on target without muscular input. Mm. Only a master can say that. Right. And as soon as I heard it, as soon as I heard it, it smacked me in the face like that. Like if, if people say stuff like, you know, uh, it's enough to learn one thing. Uh, not when you've spent a lot of money to go to class. You should learn more than one thing. But <laughs> if I was looking for one thing, that's that was the thing that that's the reason I attended that class that. Uh, and I, and I use that in my class and I go, Hey guys, you know, that's point I am. I got this from Pat McNamara and I tell him just what I told you and people go, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, but, but that's my point is it's, it's obvious that Pat not only can operate the gun, he can operate the range with the same level of, of competence when he can do stuff like that. Sure. So explain that a little bit to me with natural point of aim. Is it basically bringing your firearm up to your, up to your, so eyes are up you, to your face with have you ever heard, have you ever heard the term before no never heard it Mm-mm. okay so imagine a sniper laying flat on the ground looking through his scope at a target mm-hmm. so natural point of aim is if you completely relaxed is the reticle still on the target or mm. you got to like tensed there. up and everything right so uh. if you set your sandbag and everything up so that the gun is, and you are just laying perfectly there, uh, then when you shoot, you're going to be a more accurate shooter because you're not fighting the gun back and forth. So this, it's like, that's like the last little bit for a rifleman to perfect is that natural point of aim. And it applies to every other, every other thing you're doing with a gun, but it mostly applies to laying prone on the ground in some kind of position with a long gun, you know, to shoot a long distance. Sure. That's, where, that's where it's most critical. Yeah, I mean that <clears throat> that makes total sense. I think that applies just broadly to life too, whether you're doing a podcast or training jujitsu or archery or having conversations. How comfortable are you so comfortable with it that it becomes second nature and natural for you? Right. Right. Yeah. Interesting. When you're out in public, what are the, some of the things that uh that you're observing that you're looking for that might be a red flag, things to be aware of? Obviously, you've got your eyes up. You're scanning the environment, but what is it that you're actually looking for or observing? So, I mean, in general, let's say for in a, in a vehicle, the most dangerous time you'll be around your vehicles when you're getting out of it or getting into it. That's the most likely place for attack. Because um, you're vulnerable at that point? Th- that, because that's where criminal, like, uh, say, say, for instance, criminal, let's say, let's talk about car thieves. Um, if you go to the mall or wherever and you get to, you walk away from your car and you look back for your car. If your car is still there, when you get to the door, it'll be there when you come out of the mall. That's how fast mm. cars. Work. So there's wow. two methods, two methods for car thieves. One is they find you in traffic and they follow you somewhere. And they, and so when you're getting out, 
they rob you. Why would they? Why would somebody follow you? Is it they're, they see the vehicle, they want that vehicle, or they yeah. see you? What is it? Shopping, the vehicle. shopping for a vehicle. Yeah, okay. they're shopping for a vehicle. Okay. The other thing is they go, they go shopping while you're in the mall. They drive up and down the roads until they find the car they want. Then they just get somewhere and, and wait. And then when you come out, when you're getting into your car, that's when they will approach you. And so those are the two, the two highest uh, likelihoods of, of carjacking or robbery. They don't, they don't do the in the middle of traffic jerking people out of the car anymore. That's, that's, that's from the 90s. They don't do that anymore. They, they, they shop and they get you while the car is not moving. It just seems like it would be easier, which is they're looking for the path of least resistance. Mm-hmm. And you, you come out, you got the armload of stuff and all that, you know, from the, the, the store and you're distracted, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. OK, so that's what you're looking for if you're if you're in a vehicle. You know, what if what if you're in a public space, you know, you're at Disneyland or you're at the movie theater or the mall or whatever. I hear guys, I hear guys all the time. They go, well, I never let anybody get within 10 feet of me. <laughs> and I'm right. Like, Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Dude, all I can say is just, you know, you got to keep your head up. You know, you just got to look around. I just, I, I, I pass off my seemingly predatory <laughs> um, gaze at people by saying hello to everybody. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so what I've, what I've found is that that's kind of like a sonar. I can say hello. And what I get back tells me a lot about that person. You know, they, it's a very comfortable, oh, hey, how's it going? You know, that, that tells me a lot, of, a lot about that person. Um, and uh, that's, you know, just there's, there's no way around it. People are going to get close. And, and anybody that thinks that they're going to keep people 10 feet away from them has never been to a, an Asian country. I'll tell you that. They have no, I'm sure. they have no sense of personal space like we do at all. Uh, <laughs> it's just, you know, something you're, something you're around. The reason, the reason that, that 70% of gunfights happen closer than 10 feet uh, is because they cannot impose their will on you from further away than that. They can't take your wallet or rape you or, or whatever the case may be from across the parking lot. So they have to get close. So crowds, I'm not as worried about like a crowd thing would be a pickpocket. That Mm. would be a crowd problem. The parking lot, the lonely parking lot, that would be the, the mugging guy, you know, the coming up with a gun knife or whatever. So, you know, I mean, broad daylight especially with people around i'm not as, i'm not worried about a mugging um, right it seems to me correct me if i'm wrong but i mean you talked about pit pickpocketing scenarios in crowded places but also somebody looking to inflict mass casualty would be in an environment like that as well versus yeah. you know singling somebody out trying to rob them trying to steal their car etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah and, and what i tell people about like mass shootings is if the crowd of people is running a direction you run by yourself this way. And yeah. Reason, explain and, that. Yeah. Humans, humans won't do that. We have what's called a herding instinct, like all other animals. And, uh, when, when, when you hear, when you hear the term safety in numbers, that's talking about how a group of animals, uh, reproduce to keep their species going. So mm. their safety in numbers means that if there's 500 zebras, if lions eat 20 of them, it's not a real big deal for their population. Well, if you're one of those zebras, it's a big deal. It's a huge deal. <laughs> safety in numbers does not apply to individual safety. Okay. And uh, so, so let's say <clears throat> uh, like the, the, the shooting in Las Vegas and everybody was kind of crowded up. He just shot into the crowd. I'd rather be the one person running across. He's not going to stop shooting into that barrel of fish to pick out one person running across. He's not. His odds of hitting anything go way down. Every time he fires a bullet into the mob, somebody's getting hit somewhere. Mm. Every, every time I try to shoot at this moving target, I'm just going to I'm gonna miss. <clears throat> so I tell people all the time, I tell my kids all the time, I tell my grandkids, run away from people if there's an emergency like that. Yeah, that's true because basically you're getting off, you know, the term we hear is get off the X, right? Get off the X. And that's essentially what you're saying, it sounds like, is get away from being the target. Well, I, I and I think the target is the crowd. Sure, not, right. Not any Yeah, part- in that situation, in, 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 a, in a crowded environment, you individually are not the target. As many people as possible are. Right. Sure, makes sense. You, all, I've also heard you say – run hide fight so we're talking about running towards the fire hiding right cover not necessarily concealment but cover and then 
shooting well, that guy a, in the face. That's <laughs> what you said. Well, that's run, hide, fight is a federal program where they want you to run away, hide somewhere. But if the guy finds you, then pick up stuff in the room and throw at him. <laughs> Good I, luck. I changed it to run toward the gunfire, hide behind cover and shoot the motherfucker in the face. Do you think that is appropriate? Like, when is that appropriate? Like, how would you determine that that is an appropriate course of action? I, I totally understand the running towards because you're getting away from the crowd. I don't know if hiding and engaging is, is appropriate in all situations. What, what situation is it not appropriate? Um, that's a good question. So I would I'll, say – Let me continue. I had a guy say, well, I'm not going to do that because I've got a seven-year-old kid, and, and who's going to explain to him why I'm dead? And I'm, 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 I'm like, first off, why are you dead? But, but, but why can you not be a hero? But secondly, I want to see you explain to a seven year old uh, kid whose father is dead, why you could have help and chose mm. not to. And uh, so it's not, it's not whether or not I'll live. It's what can I live with? And if I carry two guns and tourniquets and all this stuff and two lights and all this crap, and the shit comes down and I don't do anything, I'm not going to be the fucking cop outside the door at the fucking Florida school letting kids get shot. I'm not going to be that guy. I'm not going to be the guy that says my family is the only ones that are important. I'm not going to be that guy. I'm not telling anybody else to do it, but what I'm saying is it's not whether or not I live if I do it. It's can I live with myself if I don't. Yeah, that's a, that's a valid distinction. I hadn't considered that, but I can definitely see what you're talking about. I guess um, it goes back to what you were saying earlier is who are you saving, right? Whose life are you saving? And in that situation, you are potentially saving your seven-year-old child or the other hundred people that, that are behind you. Dude, I, I don't know you, but when I got a text from you saying, I'm going to go over here and see if I can help where these people got hurt, that, that, like – whether or not you agreed with what I just said, I know what you would have done. Yeah, yeah. I would like to think I would in that situation. I, I guess you never really know, but. People that are wired that way are wired that way. Like, you don't even get a choice. Um, I, 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 I see you got some red in that beard. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> have, you read, have you read the book Born Fighting? No, I haven't. I'll have to check it out. You have a genetic predisposition for warfare. All hmm. all teachers do. Is that uh, right? Interesting. 47% of the combat deaths in Vietnam were Scotch Irish. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Absolutely. There's a book I'll have called to Check that out. Born Fighting. Yeah, you you would dig it. You would dig it. But uh, I got a little red I got a little red in mine, but I'm not I can a full see it. Ginger, not a full yeah. ginger. I'm a, I'm a day walker. I can tan. <laughs> I can't I go from white to red back to white. That's all I do. So the, the the gingers hate me. They can't steal my soul. I got all your all your powers, but none of your weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> so all right. So let's let's flip that on its head a little bit. Somebody who maybe is not predisposed to run towards the fire, is that something that can be programmed? Um, or should be? I mean, is it even in their in their blood and their DNA to do it? I get asked a lot, and um, my my thinking is that. Uh, that everybody's a fighter genetically. I mean, we've been on the earth, you know, a couple hundred lifetimes now, like you're carrying somebody's DNA. That was a fighter. There's something in you. And I mean, no doubt, no doubt. The best of the best. Right. Uh, except for the people that are allergic to gluten. I figure their, their family's very, very mad at them, but anyway, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but no, I, I, I get asked all the time, you know, like, you know, what can I do to, to make sure that I do the right thing. I'm like, you're doing it. <laughs> like mm. you're thinking about it. You're, you know, you, you can make a decision. I mean, you know, the, the, uh, you know, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage means you're afraid and you do it anyway. And, uh, I, I mean, I've, I've got a, a lot of friends in the in cops and SWAT cops and Rangers and seals and special forces and Delta force and, and all of them. And, and they've been in, tons of crap and i go were well, you scared and I go, fuck yeah i'm scared like none mm -hmm. of them none of them shy from that sure you know yeah uh, you know so but uh I, I say if you make the decision then the decision is made yeah i guess it would take for somebody who may not have uh, have as much of that in your dna like you're talking about it would have to be more of a conscious thought ahead of time 
training and thinking about it ahead of time in order to act in that situation, act with their, their, their moral compass, if you will. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. That's so, go ahead. Theory. <laughs> yeah. So somebody who's, who's interested, cause I know there's a lot of guys who, who would be interested in firearms training and interested in, you know, just making themselves more capable as, as, as like Pat would say, a, a sentinel, right. Or protector. Like, wh- I, what is it that they should be doing? What, the, what should they be looking into? Where do they get started? Like, like, how do we get going with this stuff? Uh, you know, that's, that's a tough, that's a simple question. And it's a very complex question at the same time. Um, like if somebody came to me and say, Hey, I want to, I want to do this gun thing. I'd say, don't buy anything. Mm. <laughs> don't buy, don't buy anything. Come to a class. I'll loan you a gun and take the class. And then when you leave the class, you'll, you'll be an educated consumer. Sure. But the thing we do is we start buying stuff. We buy mm-hmm. all this stuff, these fancy guns and all this stuff. And, and then guys, you know, like anybody that wants adjustable sights, uh, has got a trigger flinch. They got a real bad flinch. Mm. Anybody, you may say, where can I buy adjustable sights for a Glock? You dude, you, your money ahead, go get in a class. There's yeah. nothing wrong with your sights. Right. And, uh, but, um, They're I don't trying know, to compensate it, for lack of technique is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Sure. And well, the thing is, we, we can buy gear. We can't buy skill. And if we buy if, if we buy gear like like Tran Butler is a fantastic friend of mine. He's crazy. He's a fucking loon. But what a friend. What a great guy. <laughs> I've got some of the Tran guns, you know, the John Wick guns. I've got some. Oh, of them. yeah. I can't shoot like John Wick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've heard somewhere. I, I can't remember what context, but they said something to the effect of. If you could choose to have the the gear or the skills, and it could have been sports, it could have been in firearms training, I don't know what it was, you should always, always, always choose the skill because that well, gear you can acquire. What you're probably talking about is I've said I've said to people, what would you rather have, training or a gun? Sure. And people say gun. And, and, and I go, no training. And they're like, you're yeah. crazy. You're crazy. And it's funny because we're talking about here's Pat Mac again. You'd think I'm stalking him or something when he <laughs> was, I, I just floated this thing out on, on the social media and everybody's railing against me, not everybody, but some people. And so Pat Mac pulls up, gets out of his truck. This is in front of his class. I go, Hey Pat, if you had to choose to have a gun or have training, what would you choose? He didn't even hesitate. Training. Like yeah. he didn't even hesitate. He didn't even hesitate. Yeah. Uh, but, um, that, but everybody that chose gun, I asked, I said, is there anybody that chose having a gun that has training? Not a one of them had any training. So these are all novices, so guys just getting into it. Uh, no, there's there's novices that have owned guns for 40 years. I train them mm-hmm. all the time. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. That makes sense. So get them into so so uh, so firearms training obviously what is, uh, is something um, anything else like are you uh, are you into martial arts do you you practice any any sort of martial art? Um, uh, Kenjutsu, occasionally. Uh, I'm I'm in the middle of nowhere, so it's hard for me to 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 train. I've been studying sure, Kenjutsu yeah. for 14 years, but um, um, I I tell my students uh, find a reputable mixed martial arts or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu gym. I said it for a couple of reasons. All of us could stand to be in a little bit better physical condition. No I, said doubt. That, I said learning learning how to fight's good because there's a whole lot of space between not doing anything and killing a guy. There's a whole bunch of space in the middle there. I said that's good. And then also one of the tools that, that criminals use is intimidation. How are they going to intimidate you if two or three nights a week you fight black belts for fun? Mm-hmm. <laughs> good point. Good point. <laughs> well, I mean, so there's there's three really good reasons to pick up some type of you know, or wrestling or boxing. I tell people all the time, don't fuck around with a 160 pound high school wrestler. They will tie you in a fucking knot. No doubt. That's absolutely <laughs> true, man. Well, and, and not only that, even jujitsu. You know, I when I when I started training, uh, yeah, 160 pound guys, even females, like there's no way this 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 woman or this, this lightweight is going to do anything to me. And all of a sudden I'm like, he's got his arms wrapped around my neck and I'm like, okay, I'm done. I give, <laughs> you know, it's like that training, even just a little bit goes such a long ways. Absolutely. 
I, I meant to ask you about something because you said you, you were talking about space, like uh, like criminals are, are, are attempting to, to, to close space, right? And so your goal in, in that case should be then to um, create space, right? Or, or close the space. Never hang it because I've heard of I've heard of it defined as like uh, maybe you have a, a different term for it, but um, green, red, green, right? So no. is that okay? So explain it to me. So uh, let's say if somebody's going to attack me, um, and let's say they're they're raising a knife or a bat or something like that. Well, if I'm if I take a step back, I might just get the the bat or whatever. Sure. So that's when. I'm, I might get my gun retention position and move into the swing. So you don't catch the brunt end of that weapon. All right. So I stand, so I get hit by their arm as, as they're coming around with it. Instead of, instead of it, that thing smacking me in my head or stabbing me in my chest. How much of this is reactionary? Just, and when I say reactionary, I'm not even necessarily talking about I can trained answer. reaction. I can I can answer your question. If it's if you have a pistol in your hand, it's reactionary. If you have a long gun in your hand, it's on purpose. Mm. So you would not. But again, having a pistol in that reactionary is is it has to be trained, right? I mean, you're not naturally going to go for that if you had, if you don't have any training. Oh yeah, no, it, it all the you, you have to be trained. Yeah. I guess what I'm alluding to is, um, are you you're familiar with Tony Blower? I know who that is. He talks about, and, and I'm, I'm not completely versed in what he addresses. He's been on the podcast, and he may be coming on again in the near future. But he talks about uh, the body's like flinch system, for example, where, where it will naturally, without any training, naturally respond to threats and things that it sees. A, a great example, I saw a video on Instagram the other day, and there was a, a – maybe you saw it. There was a deer that – like slammed through, crashed through a barbershop window. And there was, I, I think a woman sitting on the couch and she just moved like just barely just moved over to the left. And that deer just went right over her shoulder without barely even touching her. And to me, I, I look at that and think, well, that's, I mean, she didn't train for a deer to come through the window. That's just a flinch response that kept her alive. Potentially. It's pretty, right. pretty fascinating what the body can do just inherently and naturally. So basically we've, uh, all this down to very simple parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system or sympathetic nervous system takes over. We don't have any control, but our response to loud noises, we have a lot of primal fear, sudden loss of breath, sudden loss of balance, but loud noises is one. The mm -hmm. knees flex, which means the knees bend slightly out. The shoulders come up to protect the neck. The hands come up to protect the face. Uh, boom. And that, that's the startle response. So when you watch these videos of crowds and there's a bomb goes off or whatever, you'll see the whole crowd boom, do that. Right. And, uh, and so, so I think, uh, I, I don't know, Mr. Blair, he's got a fantastic reputation, but I believe that part of his, his thing is the drills start with the hands coming up and that's where they start. But that would, uh, that would make a lot of sense. That's par say it again, parasynthetic system. Parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is right now. Okay. Sympathetic is uh, the human response to threat, where we have the adrenaline rush and you know and all that stuff. And so sympathetic is just natural response. Right. Parasympathetic is you training towards a certain activity to ingrain that into your procedures. Uh, hold on a second. So um, basically, parasympathetic nervous system is when we are not in fear for our life and okay. for the. For the, so I, I, I describe this to my students as scientist brain and caveman brain. So mm. when, we're, when we're below 165 beats per minute, scientist brain. When a heart rate spikes and we go above 165, and that number varies per person, but we go above 165 beats per minute, we have no control over it. Then we switch to the caveman brain. Is the goal to switch to the caveman brain later or like do you see what i'm saying like is it to train your body to have a natural or a different response to these situations well uh we do five things under stress fight flight freeze uh, uh posture fornicate fight flight freeze fornicate posture <laughs> fight flight freeze fornicate posture so posturing is like in the south we call bowing up like hey what, okay. what? right sure that's posturing um 
fornicate, people kind of giggle at that one, but but maybe not now, but the first time you when it had to happen, you're like, what the fuck just happened? Okay, that was a full-on adrenaline rush. Uh, pot, uh, freezing is a, is a holdover from when saber-toothed tigers hunted us. We didn't coexist with dinosaurs, but we did coexist with tigers. And so one of the things we would do is we'd stop because just like them, we have – predator's eyes and we and they are attracted to fast flickering movement so the freeze was a response to maybe the tiger walks past us and doesn't eat us and uh, uh people that aren't trained uh very well or children they wind up doing that quite frequently and mm. uh, a fight or flight Until you learn it doesn't really necessarily work all that well is that you get trained out of it again it's sympathetic mm. and uh, i believe it i think we outgrow it mostly but sure. uh, that leaves fight or flight. And so a lot of things happen to us. But with the adrenaline rush, the big things that happen to us are blood leaves our extremities. Blood leaves our face. Blood leaves our fingers. And this is where uh, people say he was white as a ghost or teeth were chattering, hands were shaking. It's where it's where fingers turn to flippers. That's why I teach people to run the slide on their gun instead of trying to find little buttons on there. Because under the mm -hmm. effects of adrenaline, uh, it's, it's tough. And so I tell people to do this. The scientist brain is what I'm training, and the scientist brain knows. Well, I'll just count my rounds. I'll know when to, uh, you know, I'll I'll know when I need to reload because I'll count my rounds, or I don't need to, to rack the slide every time because I'll I'll know I can just press this button or this or do this or do this <laughs> and don't do anything because I'll because I'll have all my wits about me. The problem is, as soon as that damn caveman brain takes over, that motherfucker can't count, he can't spell, he can't read, uh, he don't know shit, and he's mm -hmm. not very coordinated. He's really strong though. All the blood leaves and goes sure. to our extremities. From our extremities goes to our large muscle groups in preparation for running for our life or fighting for our life. And so he's incredibly strong, but he just can't fucking count. Mm. So then the the response to that is train your systems and your procedures so you can operate in those situations. That's why you're talking about racking the slide, for example. Right. So every time I do this, I do this. Every time I do that, I do that. I, there's no thinking about it, and that that. That's it. Like that, mm. I do that every single time. I don't have to think about it because the caveman doesn't think like he's, he's not, a, he's not a, you, you know, he didn't do rodents thinker, you know, that's not the sure. caveman. <laughs> um, and uh, so, um, and so what I try to tell my students is let you know, just trust me for two days, take in our fighting pistol class, just do what I say. And then, then by the end of it, after I explained the science of it and the, the biological reactions and all that, by the end of it, they go, OK, this makes perfect sense. But mm -hmm. on the Internet, people that don't have any training and furthermore, uh, to come to training, you have to risk ego. And most mm -hmm. men are unwilling to risk ego uh, so they won't go and do things. So, see, getting married is why women get married so they don't have to have sex. Men get married so they don't have to dance anymore because we fucking hate it because it fucking makes, it makes us risk our ego. If we don't look manly <laughs> out there, if it doesn't reinforce our positive self-image, we don't want to do it. Mm. Yeah, that which is interesting because it's kind of counterintuitive to our, our natural inclination as men to step into the role of protector. It's, it, it's a direct odds with it because what we end yeah. up doing is, is exposing ourselves to all these risks for, for the sake of maintaining our ego. It's crazy. Right. It is interesting that you're talking about this, these different types of brains, because I've actually experienced in my life where I turned into those, and I didn't have the term, but the flipper hands, where I noticed my fingers started to tighten up a little bit, and I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't manipulate them, right? I couldn't flex them. And, and what's interesting <laughs> is you can't outthink it, nope. right? I'm like, what the hell's going on? Like, I need to be able to like, come on, and you just can't outthink it. It's just what the body does inherently. It's pretty... It's pretty amazing right. and pretty kind of scary at the same time, actually. So, so the scientist brains get insulted when I go, "Hey, I'm gonna, ha I'm gonna treat you like I'm not gonna treat you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat your gun handling, the gun teaching, uh, like you're dumb." And they're like, yeah. "Well, I'm not dumb. I'm a scientist." And so it insults them. So they resist it. They resist it. They resist it. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I, I do agree with you. I mean, I, I myself personally, you know, it's like I don't, I don't want to go to training and get choked out and. I don't want to look like a fool and I don't want to ask questions because in a way too, we've been conditioned, whether it's by our fathers or other people, that if you ask the wrong question, heaven forbid, because you're going to get mocked and ridiculed and, and made fun of. And so we stop asking questions. We stop putting ourselves in uh, compromising situations that could potentially help us down the road because we don't want to feel like that. Yep. 
Wild stuff. Well, hey, man, we're we're uh, we're winding down on time a little bit here. I want to be respectful of your time and what we had committed to. Um, obviously, we could talk about this all day and longer. There's so much to go into. But for the sake of time, we'll let the guys connect with you and 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 uh, and figure it out from there. But I do want to ask you a question as we wind down. Uh, the first yeah. one is, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a man? And I assume you mean manly. Because as opposed man to what? Womanly. Yes. Uh, so not so. Yes. Manly. In, in this, Absolutely. In this, crazy, in this crazy world that we live in. Man used to be a biological reference. Sure. And I and I would consider that male. <laughs> I, I get it, but I'm just saying, I just want to be clear. How about this? Uh, and I'll start with this. Um, and you probably don't expect me to quote Albert Einstein, but um, Einstein said, to be a warrior, and I believe manly, to be a warrior means to be um, genuine every moment of your life. And so I think that what being a man is, is being yourself, telling the truth, doing the right thing, even when it's not popular. I believe that that's what being a man is. I dig it. And I appreciate that about you. Um, like I said, I've been following you for a while and, and, and been into your stuff and I'm gonna have to actually take some training from you. I think that'd be a lot of fun and definitely help me as well. Uh, but I, but I, I recognize that and acknowledge that of you as somebody who's willing to say what needs to be said, although it may not always be popular or make people feel warm and fuzzy. Uh, it seems to me it's the truth and it will help people along the path. And that's what definitely what you're doing. So I appreciate that. Now, normally this is where I ask people to, uh, let us know how they, how we can connect with you, but you already told me what your response is to that. So my, my response is always, uh, if they are too stupid to find me, I don't want their money. And <laughs> we talked about this earlier, but if you were insulted by that, I don't want you as a student. And and here's my thing. Uh, not everybody deserves to train with me. Not everybody, not everybody gets to there. I, there's a lot of people I, I dissuade from, from, from training with me because they don't, I don't think they'll appreciate it. And I certainly won't appreciate their attendance. What might be a red flag that would, that would be an indicator of that? Um, People saying, I heard you do this at your classes and I don't want to do that. Whatever mm. that, whatever it is, you know? Yeah. So you think they're probably coming in with an ego or some sort of uh, preconceived notions of what this is, or they think they already have it figured out. So everything they're, they're going to try to undermine all of your training. On uh, on the gear list for all my classes, the first thing on the gear list is an open mind. So when you send me a email and you say, I'm not going to do this, or I don't want to do that in your class before you even heard why I'm teaching it or how I'm teaching it, uh, that tells me you don't have an open mind and you therefore don't deserve to be a student. Mm, I can appreciate that for sure. Definitely not popular, right? Cause everybody has to be welcomed and everybody has to be appreciated and everybody has to feel good, not necessarily popular, but the truth. And I can definitely, definitely appreciate that. Listen, listen, I trained uh, 5,712 people last year and other instructors who are my friends, but don't have nearly that kind of attendance. They always come up to me and they go, man, how, how is it that you talk to people like that? And they still come to your classes. And I go, those people don't come to my classes. <laughs> <laughs> Great point. Yeah. You're not having to convince those people, right? <laughs> no, that's good. That's really good. Well, hey, James, I appreciate you, man. I know we, we, had to, we had to reschedule a couple of times, which I take responsibility for, but I do appreciate your time. Excited to get this out to the guys. They're really going to appreciate it. Um, and uh, thanks again for imparting some of that wisdom on us. Well, well uh, I'm holding you to coming to a class. I'm holding you to that. Where, so tell me where you're located. Where's home for you? What state? I'm in Maine. Uh, the closest I get to you is Pennsylvania. Okay. But Tennessee, Tennessee is my home base. And if you came to Tennessee, I could give you the VIP treatment, which means not really much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll uh, I'll come down there. I've got my in-laws in uh, in the Nashville area, so I'll come down there and pay you a visit. I'm 75 miles west of Nashville, and for and for people listening, that means I'm also 75 minutes west of Nashville. That's right, because around here it'd be you know two right. hours. So yeah. <laughs> All right, James. We'll let you get going. Appreciate you, brother. Thanks for joining us again. Yeah, man. Anytime.